I'm Anna Dea, and this is Michael, and we've been doing hey. Voices for the Future for several years now. And today we have the distinct pleasure of interviewing Bob Atkinson, and I'll tell you a little bit about Bob over here. Um, I won't name everything because his bio is full of things and very long, but he's a PhD award-winning author, educator, and developmental psychologist. In 2020, he won the Gold Nautilus Book Award as co-editor for Our Moment of Choice, Evolutionary Visions and Hope for the Future, which is where I first came across you as a member of the evolutionary leadership. We all got the moment of choice, and I've been reading that over the years. Um, he also won uh, Silver Nautilus for the story of our time from duality to interconnection to oneness, author and co-editor of nine other books, his PhD is in cross-cultural human development and a postdoctoral fellowship from the University of Chicago, professor emeritus at the University of Southern Maine. And I believe that's where you live now, right, Bob, in Maine? That's right. That's right. Yeah. And uh, an international recognized authority on life story interviewing pioneer in the techniques of personal myth-making and soul-making, director of Story Commons, founder of One Planet Peace Forum, and a member of the Evolutionary Leadership, which is how both Michael and I know Bob, and just delighted to have you on today talking about your new book, A New Story of Wholeness, an Experiential Guide for Connecting the Human Family. Welcome. Thank you. Great to be with you both. Yeah, good to see you, Bob. Good to see you. So we like to start with a backstory. You know, what led you to where you are now? What experiences from your childhood or early life led you to write this book or even any of the things you've done? We just want to get to know you a little bit more. So tell us your story. Okay. Um, well, it's great to be with you. Um, so it, before I start with my story, I just wanted to uh, give a context to that because I think that um, I think we're we're um, we're all participants in the story of our time and uh, a new story that will shape, define, and carry us into the future that we now envision. So we all have an important role in the story that's unfolding this very moment. And what we need more of, I think, is what I like to refer to as conscious storytelling. And that, that's a two-part process of living into the consciousness of wholeness and telling others about it. So that's kind of what happened to me in a roundabout way. Um, however, that kind of experience unfolds in our lives, uh, it's, it's about uh, living into a wholeness that kind of sneaks up on us and changes who we are and and what our priorities are. So, so conscious storytelling is passing this understanding on to others in a way that's totally natural to us, and and that's kind of why I think that um, you know I it, that it's okay for me to tell my story. Not that it's uh, at all any more important than others, but but really because it is much more than just my story. And so I, I became aware of something new and different happening in my life when I was around 24, after um, there had been many other 
moments prior to that uh, that kind of prepared me for being ready for what I was being drawn into at that at that time. And uh, I was really uh, drawn to from an early age to the mysteries of reality that around me that I didn't understand. As a child, I really enjoyed regular walks in the woods near my home. There were special times to put me in touch with the living universe. And there was something about the woods, the stream, the trees, and all of nature that really sang of union and heralded a call to my soul. So one experience during my childhood, when I was about nine, my grandmother came to stay with us for a while and she modeled for me the life of the spirit. I was fascinated by her daily devotion, reading as she would be in her room with the door open so I could observe her reading from the Bible in the upper room. And I didn't know it then, but she made a that and she made a real difference to my soul. It was around that same time that I was sitting on my bed one one day looking out the window, reflecting on my grandmother's faithfulness and a voice from within or maybe from someplace else came to me saying, someday you will know God. This uh, propitious moment took its place in a subtle thread running below the surface of my life for a number of years. And it wasn't until I was in college majoring in philosophy that I realized that the supreme force of the universe is unknowable, but its essence is manifest everywhere. Mm -hmm. And so after a degree, uh, after a master's degree in folklore, I continued my study in philosophy, world religions and mythology as their common core became more and more evident to me. Then in the summer of 1969, I was called into a wholeness that I was not yet aware of as a series of interconnected experiences unfolded that seemed like they were waiting for me to arrive. The right people came into my life at the right time. Nature spoke to me in ways I hadn't before and circumstances brought unimagined opportunities. I was a counselor at a summer camp and one July afternoon, all of us gathered around a small TV to watch the moonwalk. Mm -hmm. Seeing the earth as never before with no boundaries, just one planet with one human family on it, that changed everything for me, began to really change everything. And then a couple of weeks later, Pete Seeger had invited me to sail on the maiden voyage of the Hudson River Sloop Clearwater from New York to Albany. Yeah. And just before boarding at South Street Seaport, I listened to him as he shared his vision from a stage. He said, the idea is simple. We want people to come down to the river again, young and old, black and white, rich and poor, long hair and crew cut. See, everything in this world is tied together. Once you clean up a river, you have to work on cleaning up society. So he became my mentor just in time as my evolving worldview solidified around knowing all things in the same whole are interconnected. After a few sloop festivals along the way up the Hudson River, the Clearwater arrived in Albany, just in time for a few of us on the crew to attend the Woodstock Music Festival, oh, yeah. where, where yeah. some 400 of us actually experienced a community of wholeness. That fall in a small cabin in the woods by the river, I lived and I deepened my study of the world's religions further and explored the cycles of nature in the woods around me. And that uh, winter, I lived as a guest in a nearby Franciscan monastery and on a visit to New York City one evening, I was walking down 8th Street and the 8th Street bookshop window, uh, something caught my eye, a book on mythology. 
So I walked inside and after paging through the book for a while, I looked up at a poster on the wall on the bulletin board next to me and I discovered that Joseph Campbell, whose book I was reading, was giving a talk that same evening in Cooper Union, just mm -hmm. a few blocks away. And with minutes to spare, I walked right over there. Sitting front and center in the, in the great hall as it filled around me, I listened intently to every word he had to say. And it was as if I was the only one in the hall because he was describing an ageless archetypal pattern perfectly mirroring my own experiences at the time. So afterwards, I introduced myself, told him how much what he had to say meant to me. We kept in touch and I visited him in his Greenwich Village home a few times. On one of those occasions, he gave me a signed copy of his book, The Mass of God, Creative Mythology, in which he wrote, a thought I have long and faithfully entertained is the unity of the human race, not only in its biology, but also in its spiritual history, which has everywhere unfolded in the manner of a single symphony, irresistibly advancing to a mighty climax. So he became another mentor, helping me make further sense of the universal pattern I was living at the time. And I had no idea then that I would soon returned to the college I graduated from three years earlier to teach a course on how the poetry of folk rock lyrics followed the same pattern. Mm -hmm. This is what these experiences had been preparing me for the whole time. And I got to share them with student, with, share with the students my lessons from all these experiences. So these adventures gave me a firsthand experience of seeing how all things are tied together with only artificial boundaries in a greater wholeness. And they also became a mentor. Uh, they also became a memoir that I wrote, published as The Year of Living Deeply, a memoir of 1969, mm. and also the foundation for a lifetime of work on these themes. Wow, so you were right in there. There was a lot of awakening going on around 1969 and being with Woodstock and being at the feet of some of the greats. What a wonderful story. I'm glad we asked. Yeah, that, that is a great story, Bob. And um, really a lot of synchronicities led you along the way, almost like a, a kin to a mystic's path that, um, you know, all the different things that happened and, and really guided you. Um, so, so your your new book, um, the story of wholeness, uh, the, a new story of wholeness, an experiential guide for connecting the human family story. Um, can you tell us um, more more about what more of what it is about and and delve into it? Yeah, just briefly, quickly. Uh, it, it's a it's a book that uh, provides a way of discovering our inner pattern that guides our evolving consciousness. It's a way uh, that, that also transforms our lives, keeps our focus on the wholeness of all things, and at the same time, keeps humanity on its evolutionary path. So it's something that I came to through a lifetime of work in personal myth-making, soul-making, and storytelling. And from my studies of mythology, mysticism, rites of passage, and psychology, where I've been able to identify a pattern within our unconscious that brings all these paths to wholeness back together as one. So it's a, it's a practical and easy to use experiential guide, providing a context and framework for writing and telling our stories of wholeness. It also includes a forward by Jean Houston, weaving, reweaving our stories, and an afterward by Deepak Chopra, wholeness is what we are. They both offer insightful bookends to this principle-based toolbox for understanding the direction and pattern of our evolving consciousness and how the individual and the collective levels are always intertwined and interdependent. So you mentioned stories. So let's drop in. You know, the myths that Joseph Campbell researched, they're stories. They're stories that humans lived by and told over the fire for generations. Um, 
there's a quote I like that says the universe is not made of atoms, but it's made of stories. And so um, tell us more about the role of stories in humanity's evolution. Yeah, I think it's really about remembering where we came from. And uh, so just imagine having come from a place where all things in the entire creation make up an interconnected whole. This is the wholeness that many mystic traditions and mindfulness practices seek. It's a state of consciousness central to indigenous wisdom traditions and a unifying field of, of awareness that is available to all. And there's a, there's a great uh, storyteller's history of the world that, that gives us a sense as well. It, it, uh, this, this little story shows how we fell from an original wholeness, what, what that has brought about and where we're headed now. The story goes like this. There was a time when people gathered around campfires the center of community life, to share stories that embodied the values and principles they lived by. These stories held the community together and gave them a shared purpose. They were unitive narratives, essential to their individual and collective well-being. Then there came a time when communities expanded, spread out, became more diverse, and experienced conflict and disorder. Out of this discord emerged divisive narratives that maintain separation. Today, as we approach a consciousness of global integration, a new story of our wholeness is needed to frame this interconnectedness. It's time to come together again through unitive narratives to share our own story of living into wholeness. So this is how we can see how stories evolved over the millennia and that nothing is more vital right now than a healing vision that guides us back to our original innate wholeness. Remembrance is a meditation leading to gratitude, a practice that returns us to our eternal identity and who we are at our essence. So knowing our true identity as a whole and perfect being reminds us that we are created to live in wholeness. Hmm. Beautiful. Um, so Bob, on your, on your website, robertatkinson.net in, in um, describing your book or giving some context for your, for your new book, um, you write, we live in a time of spiritual renewal the greatest challenge of our time is recognizing the oneness of humanity. This requires the abandonment of prejudice of every kind, race, class, color, creed, nationality, gender, economic status, everything that enables a sense of superiority of every kind. Um, so so we, we live in such a divisive age now. I mean, this, as you say, the greatest challenge is recognizing the oneness of humanity, and it's really the great dream of humanity. But what do you think divides us so much now, and how can we recognize that oneness of humanity? Mm. Yeah, that's a big one. Um, <laughs> that was that, crazy. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there are, and there's no, obviously, no simple answer to that, because there are many things that divide us. We can go through a really long list of what's happening in the world and all of those things that are causing any kind of problem or conflict. That's one of the many, those are all part of the many things that divide us. So it's, it's kind of like we need a, we're at a point where we individually and collectively need a leap of consciousness to take us out of that space that we've been in for millennia and that we've become so comfortable in living with and through and by divisive narratives, that's, but that's just not working anymore. So that leap of consciousness that's required is going to lift us out of that realm of divisiveness to a, to a place where we'll be able to recognize that things still are, always have been, and always will be one beyond that 
uh, uh, perspective that keeps things divided. And um, one of the things that I think will do that for us, and this is a big part of why I wrote the book, this particular book, is that because I think there is a pattern that can be found within us as well as around us that can take us out of that uh, divisiveness that we've been in and that, and that we're really born into as we come into this temporal physical world, we're born into that realm of, of separation and divisiveness, but there's a, but we're also at the same time born with a pattern. And this is what the book describes, how, how that pattern is found in many disciplines, many ways of knowing and, and how, um, they can all, they're not only all describing the same process or the same pattern, by putting them together as one pattern, we can, we can make that leap of, of consciousness and, and move to that realm where we can see things as one. So, so it really, the, the answer to your question, I think gets back to remembering that it all begins, everything begins in wholeness. But as we've been talking about, this, this physical temporal world sets so many things in our way of recognizing this wholeness that regular periodic process of transformation is needed for our progress and our evolution back to this wholeness. So, so a, a vision of the inherent order and harmony hidden within this wholeness is found many places as well, like the hermetic principle of as above, so below, all things accomplishing the miracles of the one thing. This is also the vision that Plato offers us. He says, perhaps there is a pattern set up in the heavens for one who desires to see it, and having seen it, to find one in himself. An even more focused vision of this wholeness comes from Abdul Baha, who said a century and a quarter ago, the evolution of existence is one, the divine order is one, all things great and small are subject to one law and one order. So this is a hidden, there is a hidden thread of wholeness that connects us all. And that's what Teilhard de Chardin referred to as a single energy at play in the world. So patterns all around us that we can observe in nature and all around us are there to help us find meaning and make sense of apparent randomness. And the earliest indigenous peoples observed these patterns in nature and they gave them wisdom to live by. So the indigenous peoples observed the cycles of nature and applied these to their own lives and stories to live by. And also built into their rites of passage was a process leading to and through transformation to assist and enable the, trans, the transition to the next stage of life. And anthropologist Arnold van Gennep identified this core pattern as the three phases of separation, transition, and incorporation that guided the young person from dependency to interdependence within one's community. And transformation is at the core of that pattern that keeps us moving along a path from separation to union or wholeness. The same pattern is also uncovered within the basic structure of story itself. It's not just beginning, middle, and end but on a deeper, more meaningful level, story is really about beginning, muddle, and resolution. The muddles or challenges we face represent the core of the pattern bringing the process of transformation to its completion or resolution. So this pattern connecting us all runs deep in, in the mysticism of all sacred traditions too. Around 1900, Evelyn Underhill described the mystic way as an androgynous journey of spiritual transformation following a pattern that leads from awakening 
to purification, to union. And then some 50 years later in mythology, another version of this pattern was made popular by Joseph Campbell, who pulled together the archetypes of the world's myths to form the pattern that he called the monomyth, consisting of a journey of departure, initiation, and return. And then this pattern of living into wholeness also finds its way into the psychology of Carl Jung. He called it the individuation process. As we become conscious of the archetypes we're born with, embedded in our psyche or unconscious, bubbling up from within, released by life experiences, they not only make us aware of their innate existence, but also enable the merging of opposites into a new whole. And this, this involves a great struggle though, and takes in the stages of birth of the ego, death of the ego, and birth of the whole self. So what we end up with when these practices and ways of knowing are integrated into a single blueprint is not only a process of transformation, but also a path for living into a unitive consciousness. And this blueprint consists of the three main parts, call to wholeness, path of purification, and return to wholeness. So this is the pattern found within us that connects us to the heavens as Plato envisioned. As an essential part of our archetypal DNA, we become aware of this pattern as we communicate more and more with the inner realm. And as the eternal bursts forth from our unconscious, giving us a timeless understanding that countless others have experienced before us. This universal pattern then is a roadmap for achieving the greatest expansion of consciousness that is humanly possible. Through it, we not only fulfill our innate potential, but also by naturally wanting to pass on its understanding to others, we would transform the world in the process. This is a pattern that unites us all with a common desire to work for the betterment of the world. Thank you, that was a lot. <laughs> a lot of different pieces from a lot of great thinkers and, and very, very true that we've seen these patterns in so many myths. But I'm, I'm, I'm gonna bring you into the present for a moment with what might be a tough question because what I feel is sowing the divisiveness that we see in, in our modern time is the media. And the media loves to present everything as a conflict. Well, this expert says this, and they find the expert that's on the opposite side. And, and they find that it's clickbait, that people click on the stuff where there is this divisiveness. And this divisiveness in, 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 the, you know, in the media world and the political world is growing today. And while I agree with you that we need this wholeness and we need this transformation and these stories of wholeness, why is it people are clicking on this stuff? Why do we want to read the stories about what did Trump say this time that insulted so-and-so? Um, what is that in the human psyche and what do we do about it? Because it's really sowing a lot of discord in our world. And I don't think anybody really likes the effect of it. Yeah, right. That's that's so true. And I think it I think um the reason part part of the reason anyway why a lot of people do kind of just get um keep continue to be so not only focused on but drawn into all of that that you described so well is because um it, and and it really also depends on where we are in our own journey toward unitive consciousness. If we're nowhere along that journey yet, or if we're maybe just beginning that journey, that's going to make a big difference whether we're drawn into that kind of media clickbait or not, compared to if we're well into our own journey toward to wholeness and, and unitive consciousness. So but because, what do we do about it? What do we do about this well, in our world that's sowing discord everywhere? Yeah, so one of the, I mean, it's, it's first about recognizing, being able to 
understand that um, there is a big difference between um, what, what changes from year to year, from day to day, moment to moment, and what is changeless, what does not change. That's a big distinction for us all to be able to make. And we only come upon the, the awareness of that distinction somewhere along the journey that we're talking about. So without being very far along, we won't even think about needing to make that distinction. But when we get to a certain point, we kind of automatically or naturally begin to think in terms of wanting to make that distinction. And as we do that, then we then we begin to separate the, the false from the true or the, or the temporal from the lasting. And so it's, it's about where we are, you know, on, on our own journey and, and what what um, part of the, the, the middle part of the, I'll just say a little bit more about the, the, the muddle part of the journey, which I call the path of purification. Part of that is, um, includes being tempted by all kinds of things that are gonna, that are meant as you, as you call the clickbait to draw us into a place where we, that may not be at all good for us. So, so it's, a, it's really about just, you know, being able to know and, and make that distinction, as I said, between the temporal and the, or the false and the true. As the further along we get in our journey, the easier that becomes for us. But uh, but that's part that's a big part of what it's about is making that separation between what what is going to pass one day and what's going to be here forever. Uh, the, the the further along we get in our journey, the more focused we are not only on wholeness and unity, but on the uh, the the bigger component of that, which is about um, uh, wanting to only be uh, focused on what what is lasting, what what is maintained throughout everything. Um, Alistair Crowley said, "Thus, for love's sake, is the universe divided." And so right. that vision, you know, Wilbur talks about the diffused symbiosis, and then we have the separation, and then we come together at a higher level. So, Michael, mm -hmm. your turn. Yeah. So, so, and so this question is kind of an extension, logical extension of what we're just talking about. And um, you met when you mentioned uh, Carl Jung earlier, Bob, you talked about, you, you said Carl Jung brought up individuation. So there's individuation, there's oneness. Um, so there, there are two different concepts. And in the Chinese, um, talked about the ten between heaven and earth are the ten thousand things, which meant everything. And fin the ten thousand was always the number to represent almost infinity. So, how do we um, reconcile? And this kind of also adding to what Anna Day's question about the media and just carrying us apart. How do we reconcile the individuation, the oneness? Because we all are different, and we want to celebrate our diversity. So, so how do we bring that together? Um, diversity, oneness, individuation? Yeah, that's a great question too. Um, and I think one of the important things to, to point out about individuation <clears throat> is that it's not really what it sounds like. It's right. not about becoming an individual. That's right. It's about becoming a whole person. So Jung uses individuation as uh, to describe the process of becoming a whole person. And that and that and understanding it that way totally aligns that process with the other part that you were talking about, the, the oneness <clears throat> and and the uh, the natural organic sen <clears throat> sense of an understanding that all things in the creation, make up the most natural expression of unity and diversity there is, and including an, uh, the human body is another example of <clears throat> a natural expression of 
an incredible degree of unity and diversity coming together with, a, with each with a different part, but having a common purpose to serve the good of the whole and, and to keep the whole healthy, basically. That's what um, the, the journey to wholeness, the return journey to wholeness is about, is um, keeping, I mean, that's um, one of the results of the journey is um, regaining, keeping ourselves whole again. Uh, so, so yeah, when we, when we understand individuation in that way, it's all the same process, a journey toward oneness, a journey toward wholeness, and, and understanding uh, the, the, uh, the fullness and, and completeness of unity and diversity. Yeah, and for Jung, the individuation process had universal themes like the uniting of the light and shadow and the uniting of the masculine and feminine. And these were things that we all needed to do. We all, it was all part of our wholeness. Um, so yeah, yeah, it's an unfortunate word that he gave to it, individuation, because it implies becoming more of an individual. And yet, as you say, um, we're like, you know, instruments in an orchestra, we're playing one symphony, but we, you know, the flutes and the cellos play different tunes and you want it that way. And, and also, um, oh, sorry to interrupt, but also in the developmental process, individuation as a young child, you want to individuate. Then as an adult, you're looking for that path of connecting community, the collective, and, and that balance of individualism, collective. So so yeah, it's also a different, um, different timelines, different parts of life on that developmental trajectory that we're all on. And we all share that similarities in the humor universality of it. Mm -hmm. We usually take questions at the end, but a question just came in that's very pertinent to what we're talking about from Grace. Um, what if we want to support and promote peace, fairness, unity, and understanding in the world? But then she said, what about the need to support the preciousness of individuality within a common good while standing clear versus today's totalitarianism movements? You know, I mean, there's there's factions that say, yeah, we want wholeness, but we want it in terms of white male, you know, rich guys, you know, that's going to be the wholeness and any, anything else. If you're black, if you're a minority, if you're a woman, if you're, you know, then you're not part of the whole. That's a dangerous, dangerous way to look at. It. That's not wholeness at all. And that's not the wholeness you're talking about. Right. Exactly. So this and, uh, of yeah. the preciousness of individuality within the common good. Yeah, and that, that's again where the importance of unity and diversity comes in, because it's really about, I mean, as we, uh, you know, another, another uh, metaphor for unity and diversity is the flowers of one garden. And what makes the garden most beautiful is not uh, flowers of all the same color, but different colors and different varieties. And every, so, so it's really about unity and diversity. And what that really means is, is I mean that's really what uh, the preciousness of individuality is about. It really comes much becomes much clearer in the most diverse garden of the most um, diverse flowers because each one, through being able to express its own individuality, adds to the beauty as well as the harmony and unity and balance of the whole. So, so that whole process really is about, um, it, it's, you know, it's, it's doing two things at one time. It's, it's uh, there, the pattern that was beginning to talk about is about a way for us to reach the, uh, to reach our fullest potential in terms of consciousness and everything else that that allows us to do, whether it's you know career and, and everything else in life, um, that uh, individuality. I mean, we you know we all have our own way to to find our way through the difficult challenges that come our way and through them, and and it's through those challenges that we 
discover more and more of who we really are at our, at our deepest level. And that brings out how we're different from each other. And at the same time, it brings out how we're similar to each other. It brings out both differences and uniquenesses at the same time. And so the first thing to recognize about, um, about the, the process that we're talking about is that it's, it is designed to bring about the preciousness of individuality while, while um, safeguarding the diversity that we all have and, and need to contribute to the whole to make it even more strong. I mean, can just thinking again of the human body as an example of that, could you imagine the, the, um, the um, liver trying to be like the heart or you know whatever any other example we want to use? They, they each have their own unique purpose to serve and they have to do that as as they're designed to do not to become like others so so it's not about uniformity at all it's about true unity and diversity of of the uh, the individual expressing its fullness and that comes as we move closer to um, realizing our our uh, the wholeness that we're created with and and contributing that to to the um, diversity of the whole. Yeah. Um, so so since we've been talking about individu individuation wholeness, uh, I was thinking let's take a back step and just ask you, Bob, to um, precisely define um, wholeness and and what you since we're kind of taking it for granted people know, but maybe we should just spell it out. Yeah, that's a good good uh, thing to make sure we un we understand as well. Um, and I I try to keep the keep the uh, working definition of wholeness that I use for as simple as possible. So so I use wholeness as as it's experienced, and it's experienced in the qualities of completeness, harmony, balance and unity, those are all parts of the whole. The other thing that contributes to an understanding or definition of wholeness is, is cooperation, which is, the, is, which is really the primary principle that governs the functioning of the whole. And, and this is true on all levels. And you know, from this, as well. Right, from the simplest cell to the human body to, um, to uh, to nature, all forms of nature, uh, and, and social, the, the social collective or the human family as a whole. So, so wholeness is completeness through, again, the natural order of unity and diversity. Yeah, we've got a lot of interesting questions coming in. Um, you know, one that has been brought in is the whole issue of money and how money can separate us. Um, Patty says uh, he'd love what you're talking about to become the result, but you know, there's the big money cabal they want otherwise. And Michael responded, yes, the love of money leads to greed is something that separates us. Patty responded, I suggest that it's also enslaved many. Um, Grace says love of power and control is equally harmful. So people are bringing in these things that have interfered with our, with our wholeness um, but they are very much up in the culture right now. They're very much here. Um, and uh, so what, what do you want to say to that? Is there any way the economic system can bring us into wholeness? Oh, yeah, that's a big one. Um, economics is out of balance, first of all. I mean, that, the, the, um, the, uh, the sort of... Um, kind of way to, to, to talk about economics. What's, what's wrong with economics is this, just to say is out of balance, obviously, because um, it's um, whether, whether societies have wanted to or not, it's, 
the economic system that we've been living with for, for centuries, millennia, has created the greatest imbalance in human society that that there is. Uh, you know, it, it's it's complete. It, it's um, created a a separation greater than there ever was or needed to be before the system of of um, money that we're currently using came into came into existence. It's created a a huge gulf between the haves and the haves nots, right? And so that's the first thing that we have to think about in, in terms of um, how economics can contribute to balancing the whole. The first way would be by eliminating that, those extremes between wealth and poverty. And I'm not an economist, but there are a lot of people out there who are thinking about that and are coming up with ways to do that. I mean, it, it also involves politics and the form of government that's under. But uh, but that would be the main. Uh, I mean, if we were able to eliminate those extremes of poverty and wealth that exist now in the world, that would go a long way to to uh, you know as a as a that would become a major uh, bridge to uh, and stepping stone to peace on earth, just just by eliminating those extremes of wealth and poverty, uh, to to get closer to a balance of of uh, however the economic or financial system is utilized by any society. If those extremes were eliminated, there would be much we would be much closer to equality and equity and balance and harmony and therefore unity. Uh, so those are all essential components of wholeness that the elimination of those extremes would help bring about, help move us closer to. And of course, the question is how to eliminate those extremes. You know, the people who have money are not fond of it being taken away from them. You know, yeah, and well, and you know historically, you know, it's a good point you you brought up, Bob, because in the United States from the 1930s to the late 1970s, 1980, we had a much more the the extremes were not there because of um, the New Deal policies where where the government supported people and also the high taxation rates, so there weren't. The, the level of wealth inequality was not there. And all classes of people from poor to rich um, advanced in terms economically at the same rate. So, so, so that also leads to a wholeness when a society as a whole is, is much more equitable. So it's, it's been done at least economically. So it's not that we have to reinvent the wheel, but it's just like you said, Bob, eliminating the extremes allowing you know a small group of people to amass so much money and with that money as grace said comes power and 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 the self-interest to protect their power and their money so yeah it's like the right. yin and yang the, the two sides the wholeness the individuation and the greed and especially in america where it's all about individualism and freedom freedom to amass right. the money so yeah um, yeah, and I, I think that's where the really important role of economists in this in this kind of conversation comes in, because they're the ones that can that are coming up with um, economic systems that are based on uh, the, the harmony and balance of the whole. And I, I think one of those systems is um, called uh, donut economy. Yeah. Um, oh, economics, yeah. Yep. Um, so there, there are assist, economic systems out there that are doing this. It's just um, how those are going to be able to be applied to society or, and in society to make them work as, they're, as they uh, are designed to, on a theoretical uh, level, it, it's applying them on the practical that we, that we're, that we obviously need right now in the world. 
Yeah. So we have another thorny question that has come up uh, from Anne. What about the evil aspects of humanity? Is evil part of the whole? And if so, how did, what's, I mean, here's, these are deep uh, philosophical questions, but this has been brought up by our listeners. Yeah, right. Great, great questions. Um, and this is the kind of um, topic that brings those questions up. I think um, so. And, and whatever the context is, the whole question of evil really uh, brings up a big uh, piece to, to consider. And, and I think in this context of wholeness, we have to keep in mind that going back a minute, or so to how we were defining wholeness, which is the um, the unity and balance and harmony of all the parts of the whole, and and having all those parts work together for the benefit of the whole. If that were to happen in any in any whole system, the concept of evil. Would be would be eliminated if all the parts were were really literally consciously working for the betterment of the whole. That would um, that would take what we understand now as evil out of the picture. It would be it would be eliminated just through the process of all the parts knowing, consciously choosing to work for the better betterment of the whole. And, and again, the human body is an interesting example of that. We don't, we can debate whether or not cells and organs have their own individual consciousness to know or to decide, but somehow, sometimes something happens that, that knocks things out of balance in the human body, and that's when disease happens. But they, but without that, they somehow know that they're designed to function as a whole and they each contribute, uh, to, uh, carry out their function they're designed to, which serves the whole. And, and uh, so, so human society, the human family as a whole needs to come to that same kind of realization that um, if we really put the whole first, and above any of the parts, that would um, that would basically take evil out of the game. Mm -hmm. You know, the old religions didn't have a concept of evil. It wasn't really until the onset of the patriarchal religions that there was this great division philosophically and theologically between good and evil. Um, there was, you know, light and dark and, you know, the cycle of the seasons and birth and death and, you know, but it wasn't considered an evil. Evil is sometimes something that is split off from the whole. And by being split off, it then deteriorates and degenerates and in that way can become evil. But when something is really connected into consciousness, which is really basically what you were, were just saying, I'm just saying it in a different way. Um, that when it's incorporated into the whole and included, then its tendency to degenerate is limited. Right. Yeah. So, um, you know, it sounds like, or, or let me let me say, Barbara Marx Hubbard popularized the concept of of um, conscious evolution. So, where does that idea of conscious evolution um, tie in with what? what you're talking about, Bob, and that transformation. Yeah, that, yeah that's very much a part of what I'm uh, talking about and what, and what the book kind of covers. Um, because the book is about, um, the, the book is really built on three principles. And each of those three principles are what I think of as core principles. They're, they're evolution, consciousness, and wholeness, and together, they um, are how how I see it are what can heal the illusion of separation. And so, just just quickly, the the evolution principle. Uh, we may think or wonder if evolution is um, a straight line or whatever, but it, it's not a straight line. Evolution has built-in 
ups and downs that are spiraling towards renewal. And so renewal becomes a necessary component of evolution. And, um, you know, we see this with everything that's going on in the world today with social justice crises and political strife and armed con conflicts, climate crises, uh, even though they look like uh, sidesteps or backsliding in the long arc of evolution's direction where we are moving toward the good of the whole so the so the evolution principle is evolution is directional toward ever wider circles of unity mm -hmm. the uh, the consciousness principle is um, about the uh, you know acknowledges that there is a dynamic unfolding of a growing awareness within us and our deep relation to others in the world, and that a conscious effort is required to expand our consciousness toward greater and greater levels of comprehension, self, society, and the mysteries of life. So the, the consciousness principle says, consciousness is an innate potentiality unfolding toward right relationships on all relations, yet, Consciousness is dependent upon the initiative we take to actively investigate reality. And, and it's only through that individual investigation of reality that we move along what I think of as the consciousness continuum toward a consciousness of wholeness. And then the wholeness principle is um, where, all th where we understand that all things are part of the same web of wholeness, yet we do live as if all things are separate and even at odds with each other. But this illusion of separateness causes just about every problem, conflict, and even war that humanity's ever known. But the, um, the wholeness principle then states that reality is one and all of creation is a whole. And then the three of those principles together create sort of a meta principle of consciousness evolves toward wholeness. Mm -hmm. And I think that what that's what may be the most important thing to remember, to keep in mind as we are dealing individually and collectively as groups or humanity with all these crises around us, that we are in the midst of a process of evolution that is taking us toward wholeness. Mm -hmm. And all three of those principles each contribute to each other. I mean, evolution contributes. We, as we evolve, we become more conscious. We have creatures that have greater capacity for consciousness than we did, you know, 10 million years ago. Um, we have, and to become more conscious, we become more aware of wholeness. As we become more whole, we evolve. You know, the, each one is feeding, feeding the others. Any one exactly. of them further the other two. Yeah. Right. Yeah, um, the the movie two thousand one: A Space Odyssey, um, with with the talk of AI, keeps coming to my mind. This is the whole scene in, in the movie with Hal. But there's there's something more profound than AI and Hal and two thousand one: Space Odyssey. And this is kind of goes to the gist of what you've written about in our conversation. Is the end of the movie where the astronaut Dave. Um, a sense become the star child but the, but the point of the film is that for humanity to take the next step in its evolution we need to transform and so in this in the movie there's um aliens who are le guiding us and so but we can't put our eggs in the basket someone's going to save us but but the point of what you're writing about and what we're talking about is that we as humans have to evolve and transform to a more higher evolved level you know what what an integral theory called, talks about second tier so so is that the point of what you're and, and the wicked problems we face in the world really need more sophisticated thinking so is that also a point of what you're talking about bob yeah very definitely and that's that's a really good example that you used with um Hal and what that has, what what that me what message that has for us today still, uh, because it again it's really about wholeness. If we 
if we understand and if we live as if consciousness does evolve toward wholeness, we will be able to see the wholeness of all things as our future. It's like, um, I, I know in one of your other shows, you talked uh, about um, David Bohm, the quantum physicist. Yeah. And um, he, was, he was great in his, you know, his um, insights into the way all of these principles work in relation to how he was able to come up with a sort of a scientific discovery of how they're how they're all interconnected. I mean, he was talking about um, all things in the cosmos, in the universe, and and the movement of all things. It's it's for he realized saw clearly that it was more than apparent randomness, and um, with a with a new understanding of order based on holonomy or the law of the whole, David Bohm recognized the hidden pattern to the movement of the whole, or what he called the whole of movement. And again, he's in, he's, what he was saying is in harmony with what Teilhard de Chardin was saying, that there's a, a single energy that is ensuring this deep order to the whole. So we have the whole of movement, which is wholeness and motion, in encompassing a primary order as well as a secondary order. And the primary order is designed to express balance, harmony, unity, and peace, while the secondary order is designed to reflect that greater unity and peace while also having its own limited autonomy. So what Bohm was really getting at is that the whole of movement is evolving toward the merging of these two orders into a unitive reality. The primary order already has unity and peace as its natural state. The secondary order has unity and peace as its intended outcome. So all things working together in harmony express this, uh, this deep order of unity and peace. And, and now we can say that science as well as spirituality say that our collective future looks like the vision of peace on earth that was promised by all of the world's sacred traditions. I think we're here to create heaven on earth. Yeah. And my mission in life. Yeah. Well, yeah. we're minutes after the hour do you have a question because i was thinking we'd open it up more oh well yeah another extension i mentioned barbara marx hubbard and i mentioned 2001 but barbara marx hubbard popularized another phrase that stems from the renaissance the idea that humans from homo sapiens will become homo universalis so that's really in a way you know barbara marx hubbard has been called a futurist really a visionary but really the homo universalis, that 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 universal mind, so to speak, is really what the dream of humanity and, and our path to to something to wholeness to that new story. So well, I think you know, we also have to bring in the word holon because evolution is constantly assembling holons, and holons are anything that is whole unto itself like a whole cell or a whole body or a whole family or a whole village. Um, and the holons are constantly assembling themselves in larger holons, you know, so evolution proceeds in larger assemblages of holes, you know, mm. so that's the evolution shows this pattern as well. But, you know, the, when you realize that you're a holon, it's what is the, what am I a holon in? What is the largest the larger step up from me as an individual in my family, my community, my world, my planet, you know, the solar system, the universe, you know, we can keep on going into that. Yeah. Well, this is the point in, in the conversation where we tend to, um, we have brought in some of the comments that have been coming in, but if you want to ask Bob a question directly, type it into the chat and we will read it. And, uh, there are been, a, you know, a little bit of discussion going on in the chat. Uh, one thing that's come up is about AI, you know, which has come into the news recently with even the creators of it warning us against 
warning against its possible uh, shadow side and the risk of even extinction was in today's paper. Um, what do you see about that? AI has to be a function of the whole as well. Yeah, that's a big one too. And and there's a it's interesting how um, sort of polarizing AI has become recently, with uh, more people becoming aware of what what the uh, chat thing can do in terms of you know not not just homework assignments but way beyond that. Um, and and I'm as I'm thinking about AI and and technology in general. It's still always been about not the technology itself, but how it's used. Mm -hmm. And there's a there's an important connection here, I think, between AI and what you were saying a minute ago, Michael, about uh, about Homo universalis. As we individually and collectively evolve into becoming expressions, examples of that. Homo universalis, we will be evolving toward the place where our, what we've been talking about all night, uh, where we uh, place the good of the whole above anything, anything in it or, or, be, or you know, <clears throat> um, it, it's, it's about getting to a place where we through becoming the homo universalis that is part of our potential, um, becoming that, and then we will be expressing that, that um, desire in everything we do to contribute to the, the betterment of the whole. And, and I'm thinking it's also part of our, part of the growth of our identity um, process. Um, we, we start out, you know, identifying with our family, and then maybe we identify with our community, and then maybe with our city and state and nation. But as we become more like Homo universalis, we will be identifying as much or more with the whole, with the with the global community that we are as well. And as we identify as members of a global community, as world citizens, we will, by our very nature at that, at that place in our uh, conscious evolution, want to use technologies like AI for the betterment of the whole, rather than in any other way that a lot of people are thinking or are worried about it being used for. So, so the so the use of the technology for the good of the whole will come naturally as we individually and collectively evolve toward becoming that homo uni universalis that we are um, moving toward. Yeah. So it sounds like the message is don't despair, folks. Wholeness is where we're going ultimately, even if we have some detours going on right now. <laughs> yeah, so we, we have a question that came in the Q&A box um, from Paula. Uh, could, we not compare, could we not compare the fetal cells becoming unique organs, an individuation process that still allows the body to be a whole? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, the differentiation of the fetal tissue that turns into bones and muscles and organs, but it's still creating one whole body. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's like a symphony. All I mean, that we mentioned that before, all the instruments, all the instruments of and by themselves coming together where the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Mm -hmm. Oh, here it is. Yeah, I think that the question comes up, what are we serving? And the question of individuality and freedom and I need to get mine and the whole story is I need to make as much money as possible and put a fence around my property and you know whatnot, that's an old story. But the question that brings us into the higher level of wholeness is what are we serving? You know, what are we, 
what are we part of that's bigger than us? And and what are what do we do this for? What's the higher thing that we're serving? Uh -huh. And there's a story about someone that comes along and there's men working and they're bricklaying. And he says to one of them, what are you doing? And he says, well, I'm laying bricks so I can get paid and feed my family. And he goes to the next bricklayer and says, what are you doing? And he says, I'm building a wall. And he goes to the next one and he says, what are you doing? And he said, I'm building a great cathedral for God. <laughs> and they were all doing the same thing. But what was the perspective of, you know, the larger thing that we're doing it for? Yeah. Yeah, our, that's the thing about the journey toward wholeness is our perspective is the only thing that changes, really. Yeah. It, it's not the thing itself. It's our understanding of it, our perspective of it. And um, and that and that evolves, as you were describing with the different versions or variations on what the same what, uh, you know, the people were doing mm -hmm. in the same way. There's so many variations or, or interpretations of that, depending on where their where their consciousness is about what they're what they're doing or seeing. Mm -hmm. and, and Charles Darwin, when he was um, traveling the world, check, learning about how species survive and evolve, he came to the conclusion that um, what he called the sympathy hypothesis that that communities and species, organisms, people um, thrive when they work together, when there is a form of altruism. He never thought, he never called it survival of the fittest. That was not his term, but, but, but people, community, collectives, collaboration is really, as Darwin put forth, is the key to flourishing and surviving and evolving. So that's you know, an ex what we're saying also that that exactly yeah that, uh, thanks for bringing in that that example because um darwin got so misunderstood and misinterpreted and everything uh he he had the most for his time he had the most important thing to say about social evolution uh, aside from everything that he said about biological evolution what he had to say about social evolution was really important for its time i mean it, this is a quote that I use in the book from, from Charles Darwin. He says, as man advances in civilization, he ought to extend his social instincts and sympathies to the people of all nations and races. I mean, there's Charles Darwin talking about the golden rule writ large, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, Darwin was really misunderstood. It wasn't even him that coined survival of the fittest. That was Herbert Spencer. And Darwin talked much more about cooperation than he did about competition. Mm -hmm. Right. And so it was just, it came into that paradigm of separateness. Like you say, the paradigm is the interpretation. And we interpret everything within that. And the paradigm of divisiveness and separation takes us one place. And the paradigm of wholeness takes us another place. Yeah, so the roadmap is there, and plus we have the um, all the uh, the indigenous peoples also who lived in it in that way. I mean, they're not that we want to put them on a pedestal of the idealistic. They were the idyllic, but but they did have a much more the ancient wisdom of looking towards the seventh generation, mm -hmm. and looking forward. So, mm -hmm. um, so Grace asked a question. I, I believe, yeah. Um, I'll, I'll read it. Um, how do we ensure we don't, as a world, confuse our becoming homo universalis with abandoning our inner conscience and intuition and knowing and feeling and unknowingly finding big brother in charge? Hmm. Um, so there's a question. Don't confuse <laughs> our homo universalis well, it may be about, I mean, one answer to that question may be about understanding the uh, the qualities, characteristics of who and what homo universalis is. Mm -hmm. um, because I think the way that Barbara Marks Hubbard was using that was 
her way of describing who we are when we reach our fullest human potential or our fullest capacity as human beings. And, and there's a lot of um, discussion about what that might be too, but, but again, it's, it's about the, um, the journey to wholeness that we've been talking about all the time too. Um, when we make that journey to wholeness, and we've come to a place where we recognize that we are part of the whole and that we are here to contribute to the betterment of that whole rather than anything else. That again, like the, like the uh, question of evil might eliminate all those other um, possibilities like unknowingly finding big brother in charge. That wouldn't really happen if, if we are uh, truly and expressing ourselves as a, as a true homo universalis, I don't believe we would be, that, that that would come into the picture if we were. Yeah, homo universalis does not de deny our individuality. It just says it's a common identity. You know, uh, Benjamin Franklin said one of his best inventions was of the word American, when at the time there were Dutch and Spanish and French and English all coming together. And we didn't have a word that united everyone. And when people decided that they were Americans, that took them up a level and united them in something. It didn't mean they weren't still French and they didn't love their French cooking or their Italian cooking or, or you know, whatever uh, their language was or whatever, but there was an ide a higher identity. And I think we're at the point where instead of identifying as Americans or, or French or Germans or whatever, we now start to say we're, we're Gaians or we're earthlings or we're, you know, we have a, a, a collective definition of who we are, but that doesn't mean we lose our individuality. It just means we identify with a larger whole that that individuality is part of. Right. Yeah. This this is a great conversation. We could go on. Yeah. A yeah, we could. An hour and twenty minutes, so we'll probably need to wrap up. But most people are still on. But we'll, okay. we'll have to have you back on again, Bob, because um, this is a really you know, important conversation. Um, and and we have we have a question from Dr. Snutopia, which is um, will lead to a big discussion. But maybe we'll wrap it up with this last question. Um, and she asks, "How does this?" And it kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier about economics. How does this oneness wholeness reflect in the political and economic system? Is the United Nations a system that will bring peace? We talked about politics and economics before, so maybe the is the United Nations have the potential as a system that could bring peace. Yeah, that's about a, as big a one as we can get yeah. to. <laughs> um, well, so it's been, I mean, at its time of origin, some 78 years ago or so, the United Nations was a great idea. It was, it was an idea that, uh, that was needed, very much needed at its time. However, there were some uh, things built into its way of operating that um, created some restrictions or limitations to what it was, what it's been able to achieve toward its ultimate goal. I mean, just think of the, the name, United Nations. If that had been able to accomplish just its name, we would be well on our way to heaven on earth, peace on earth. But there's been, but like any other human organization, especially on that level, there have been all kinds of politics involved, and and that means uh, nations or or groups have been trying to do what they think is best for them rather than best for the whole. And that's gotten a lot of, um, uh, that, that's put a lot of 
roadblocks in the way for, for the United Nations to achieve even what its name implies. So there has to be some kind of a restructuring, reorganization, refocusing somehow of what the United Nations is designed to do and how, um, if and when that's going to be possible, nobody knows. But it's interesting, I think, how there are some groups among the um, among the uh, uh, the NGOs that are working toward restructuring the United Nations as it's in progress, and whether or not that as a as a ship that we're sailing on can be re rebuilt while we're still sailing on it is another big question. But but it definitely needs to um, have a, a new uh, structure of principles that are based on wholeness, mm -hmm. so that so that the uh, nations involved can really uh, work a lot easier toward what it's intended to. So the short answer to that maybe is that uh, then it needs some restructuring to accomplish what it's designed to. Mm -hmm. And like you say, it's less than 100 years old. 100 years in human, in the evolution mm -hmm. of humanity is a very, very short time. It's the first organization that has really been trying to bring that wholeness among all nations. And it's a tough job. And uh, it, like I say, it's still young. Mm -hmm. And the um, oftentimes the secretary general of the UN, who is the leader and, and the spokesman, oftentimes they are quite states men, states people, and the current one, Antonio Guterres, is really a remarkable man, and the things he has said, really outspoken in the name of protecting the sacredness of life, whether he's talking about climate change, capitalism, protecting um, animals and the helpless. Um, so he, he's like the conscience of the world. There, there are a few people like him in the world, fortunately, and all of us are, but he has a platform, mm -hmm. so there is there is an ideal of the um, of the UN, but yeah, as you say, Bob, it, it right. still yeah, and that thanks for bringing him in as a as a really great example of individuals who are trying to make that kind of um, progress and and evolve it in that direction. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, yeah. too. Yeah. yeah. Well, still, I think um, we ripen it up, huh? Yeah. Um, so it's been an hour and 25 minutes. So perhaps um, we'll call it a night or. You have any last words that you want to leave us with, Bob? Well, um, I guess I could come back to the book for a minute and just say that um, if anyone's looking for a very practical roadmap for our or anyone's Return Journey to Wholeness. Uh, this is a book that offers keys for living into wholeness. Uh, but it, it's interesting to recognize a distinction at the same time between, uh, between living into wholeness and living in wholeness. One is a process, a movement toward, and the other is uh, expanding and, and evolving while we're um, while we have already lived the experience of, of the um, transformative pattern in our lives. So so we still have well after we've made that journey and gone through the transformation that we've been talking about, we still have the significant challenge of maintaining the consciousness that comes with it and then living, as the master of two worlds, it's called. One world is characterized by the seeming duality and separation we continue to witness and live in. And the other world by the wholeness and unity we know as the core quality of all existence. So that means that living in wholeness is applying everything that we've learned from experiencing this universal pattern while continuing to grow into unitive consciousness. Mm -hmm.
it's always an ongoing process. There you go. And I, so I put the link to your website in the chat, one of the most recent chats in the name of the book, again, a new story of wholeness an experiential guide to connecting the human family. Well, thank you, Bob. This was uh, great, really incredible. Um, thank yeah. you both. Yeah, this has been yeah. fun. Yeah. And we'll be sending out the recording and uh, people can listen to it again or send it to people who haven't heard it. And Bob, you can send it wherever you like as well. Yeah. yeah. And I just want to um, mention that our next program will also be really good. It's um, the end of June, June 27th. And we're having on the guest is Scott Santons. Um, you may not know his name, but he's one of the leading advocates in the world for universal basic income. So it's program is going to be on universal basic income, um, which is really a really important concept for potentially leading to that oneness and wholeness. And, and Scott will be delving into that more. So that's, that's in another month and we'll send out emails on that. So, great. Yeah. So thank you, Bob. And thank you both very much. And join us on June 27th for Universal Basic Income, which is how we level the playing field and reduce some of those extremes of the rich and poor. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, yeah, Bob. Thank you. Thank you. Peace out.